Okay, hello everybody. <clears throat> so um, just I thought before I start today, I'll just, uh, you know, we, I'll start with a few words about myself. Just as a word of warning, because basically I'm a molecular cell biologist by upbringing. So during my PhD, I did um, membrane trafficking and imaging and basically cell bi tissue culture cell biology. And then sort of I moved into what probably is generally more considered developmental biology and developmental biology questions. And I guess the reason why I'm here is because um, throughout my scientific upbringing, so to speak, in Dresden, um, I've been exposed to this uh, close interplay between physics and biology. And also in the last couple of years, I had the um, pleasure of collaborating with Frank and other physicists. And all together, um, for this reason, I have seen the light, so to speak, in terms of um, bringing biology and physics really to bear on the questions that we are interested in. Um, but again, um, for the purposes of this talk, or this talk today specifically, will be a rather big picture biology talk where I just try to lay out the questions, the general big picture questions. And then during my talks tomorrow and the day after, I will go more into some specific problems um, that we are working on also in terms of uh, more quantitative approaches. All right, so I think the thing that brought me into biology originally, and I guess that's also probably what um, you think of when you think about why biology is interesting, is first of all, that there are these huge numbers of forms out there, right? So basically we have um, from bacteria and like single-celled organisms, at the, at the micron scale up to whales and other things um, for tens of meters um, in length, in body length. And on top of that, a wide variety of forms and functions that sort of biology systems have um, evolved. And so now, in thinking about form, I think if you think about form from the human perspective, you intuitively think about forming something along the lines of, um, for example, a potter that shapes clay into something like this, like a fish here. And I think in general, um, generating form from a human perspective um, has sort of the ingredients of, the, of, of an externally imposed shape on passive materials. And this applies both to pottery, but I think to just about any shapes that humans create, um, be it engineering or be it, be it um, yeah, ultimately shaping of passive materials. However, biology, of course, generates shapes in a very different manner. And this year, I bet you have seen this movie already uh, multiple times this week. So this is basically um, a superfish egg that started from a single cell up here. And the cell is now con continuously dividing. So at this stage, it will already be about one and a half thousand cells. Then these cells now spread over the yolk. And at the same time, here you can see cells are actually crawling inside. So this is the gastrulation process in zebrafish that um, you heard about in the previous lecture. And these cells now here suddenly start to form the head. So you will very soon see the eye come up. Here it is. Um, and at the same time, you start to see um, the somites coming up in the tail of the animal here, or of the future fish. And then in a short period of time, the tail will actually start to extend. And by that time, it already looks pretty much like a fish having gone from this single cell um, just a few hours before. And by now, it's obviously alive because it's wiggling. So altogether, what is happening, of course, in the background of this movie is that myriad different cells are being generated. Connections between cells are generated. So this is just a representation of neuronal connections in the brain. And it is not just that cells are being generated, but the cells are also being um, sorted and being located in precise positions there's morphogenesis going on, and all of these processes together ultimately give rise to the shape that we recognize as the adult zebrafish. And so in terms of thinking about, um, so yes, so very different, therefore, from um, the shaping of passive materials, the way biology generates shape is via the autonomous shaping of active materials. And so this, I think, to my mind, is, of course, the, the fascinating challenge to understand in biology is how can you go 
from a single cell or how can a single cell shape itself ultimately into myriad forms, for example, a zebrafish. And in the next couple of slides, I would just simply like to um, stay on some of the fundamental issues that have to be going on there during this process. And the first one is, of course, we go from a single cell to a complete animal that has hundreds um, of different cell types. And the cells come in all sorts of different shapes and guises, but they also do very different things. Like, for example, think about muscle cells, think about neurons, think about digestive cells or hormone-producing cells. And so this is already the first question of how to generate cell type diversity. And I think a very, very important principle here is um, that essentially cell type diversity is not generated at once, but cell types arise as the end product of a long hierarchy. And what I'm showing you here essentially is, an, um, is uh, the lineage tree of the, of the roundworm of C. elegans in which, um, in a highly stereotyped manner, um, cells, um, the, the, basically the, the cell division products, adapt specific fates in the adult organism. And so the specifics here don't matter at all, but the important point is that essentially the various cell types in the adult organism are the end product of a long hierarchy of often just simply binary decisions. And on all of this originates here from the fertilized zygote. Right? So this is the starting point that generates the entire hierarchy and also the complexity of cell types in the animal. Now, of course, it is not just a question of generating the, the right cells. But the second question is, how do you generate the right cells also in the right place? And this is, again, where we are getting back to the patterning problems that you've already heard a lot about um, during this week, where essentially um, biology uses um, signals, very often signal gradients, um, across cell fields that then um, can be, for example, uh, that then can be translated into different cell fates. So, for example, via this um, old, well, via this textbook model of the French flag, where essentially cells um, interpret the levels of a signal they see in its environment and they convert different levels of the signal into discrete cell fates. So, for example, in this case, you can imagine that at high levels of signal intensity at this end of the cell field, the cells will turn blue, and at low levels of signal intensity at this end of the cell field, cells turn red. But again, um, Clearly, animals don't just consist of three cell types arranged in, different, in a nice French flag pattern, but there are many, many, many different cell types that need to be arranged in specific places. And so again, um, there's this concept of hierarchies that essentially initial patterns are subsequently in a hierarchy of patterning processes are subdivided into patterns of finer and finer resolution till ultimately you end up with the uh, intact animal. And this here is again the Drosophila embryo that you've also seen a lot multiple times this week. And this intricate pattern of stripes here is essentially, to my mind, a beautiful example of these patterns, of this concept of patterns within patterns, where essentially the, um, the end product of the first patterning process then initiates the next patterning process and so on and so forth. So ultimately, at least you can conceptualize patterning processes um, during development as some sort of a, a Russian doll series of patterns within patterns within patterns. And um, all this, again, starts from the totipotent zygote, so from the fertilized egg, as origin of this entire process. And so putting these two things together, you can essentially um, like conceptualize development as um, basically a discrete trajectory within this arbitrary shape space where um, there's a defined starting point, which is namely the fertilized zygote. And from this de defined starting point, the system follows a very narrow and defined track that ultimately terminates um, in the adult body plan. And 
Um, obviously, just this, uh, this very simple scheme raises a whole bunch of interesting questions. Um, for example, um, in order to generate really a stereotype progression along such a trajectory, you have to think about timing, you have to think about um, then catalyzing transitions between hierarchies in this process, and you also have to think, um, of course, about morphogenesis that has to happen in the background of all of these things, which um, I have blanked out entirely in this simplified view of development. However, now, this is the pro progression of development. Um, so basically, or you can think of this as the way, uh, as basically a blueprint for how development can be organized. However, um, development is not the only way by which biological systems can generate shape. And a second um, process that can generate complex shapes in biology is regeneration. And so, for example, in this case, um, we are just uh, looking at a nude limb, which on the left is, Im, uh, is amputated just above the elbow. And what happens under these conditions is that over a time frame of about three months, um, the entire limb grows back. But first, in the sense, it's, so the animal makes the, makes the elbow, it then makes the upper arm, it makes the fingers, and at the end of the three months, you've got the full limb back. However, the entire process also works if you amputate the limb just above the elbow, or well, or down, well, what do you call this, um, distal to the elbow. And in this case, the animal never ever makes an elbow. It just goes straight into making the upper arm and into making fingers. And again, after about three months, um, the animal is left with a complete and perfectly proportioned limb that is fully functional. Now, not only um, newts can do this, but for example, also in zebrafish, if you chop off their fin, also the fin grows back. And again, no matter where you chop it and how you chop it, the, fin, uh, the final shape of the fin will again be more or less exactly um, what the shape of the fin was at the starting point. And also starfish can do this. So for example, you can take the arm of a certain starfish species and this arm at its base will generate the rest of the body plan of the starfish and it will again grow back to essentially regenerate the complete shape. And one more um, rather extreme example um, of regeneration is actually the model system that we work, work with, planarian flatworms. And so this is a, essentially um, a close-up picture of an, of an adult planarian. So for as far as worms are concerned, these animals are you know, rather charismatic because, simply because they have a pair of eyes by which they can look at you. And these worms are actually relatively large, so they can have a body size between about you know, a millimeter and two and a half centimeters in length. So easily visible. You don't need a microscope to work on these guys. However, what is really remarkable is that um, you can uh, call something like this an experiment. And this, in this case, is that we chop the animal down the midline. Um, and then we cut it eight times across. So essentially, what this generates is 18 more or less random pieces of worm. And in most animals, including zebrafish and so on and so forth, this would, of course, be the end of any interesting biology that you can study. But what happens in these animals is that very quickly, within about an hour, the wounds of the tissue pieces actually seal. And this happens by muscular contraction throughout the piece, so presumably to minimize um, the wound perimeter. And then there's, uh, there are interesting epithelial mesenchymal transitions and so on and so forth that essentially close the wound very rapidly. And this white stuff that's coming out here, this is essentially the tissue, the soft tissue on the inside of the worm that's being squeezed out by these contractions. And then what happens within about 24 to 48 hours is that you see this, um, the formation of this white rim of tissue here. And this is the so-called regeneration blastema. So this is a mass of cells that are in the process of remaking the missing tissues. And that they do this, you can already see after four days, because that's when you first see the appearance of the eye spots at this end of the animal. 
and no eye spots back there. So evidently this is going to be the head and this is going to be the tail. And then after just about two weeks, each one of these individual pieces will have reshaped itself back into a complete and perfectly proportioned miniature planarian. And so essentially the system gives us um, the formation of complete animals from more or less arbitrary pieces. And so when you think about now, um, and yeah, and moreover, this process is incredibly robust. So for example, um, you can also chop just like uh, tissues off the side of the animal. Um, and in this case, these pieces will not contain any midline tissue, for example. So they will be highly asymm asymmetric if you consider the, the mediolateral axis of, of this starting point. And what happens under such cases is that, in fact, the animal regenerates the midline and again reshapes itself back into a bilaterally symmetric structure. I have a question. So if you take a piece, for instance, containing one eye, will that eye be reused? Um, yes. So, so we'll just make one single eye. Okay, and the same thing for all the other pieces. If there's some vascular system, this will be maintained and all the missing parts will be regenerated. So what is inside the piece will be not dismantled, but maintained and preserved. Yes and no. So um, first we will get into this a little bit later. So one, you know, one design principle, even though I hate this word, but one design principle of planarian anatomy is that actually all the, um, all the essential organs are basically spread throughout the body. So this means that automatically any piece that you generate you know, will have a complement of essential organs. And they will get to some extent remodeled, but you could argue in this case um, that basically this means just existing organs are being recycled, so to speak. Um, but on the other hand, so for the eye, I think this raises an, an, an interesting point because um, this basically means that the animal, you know, the default state in the animal is not just to make de novo um, everything that is there, but to basically interpret or there's knowledge in the system, so to speak, of what is there and what regeneration does is to again complete um, the set of body parts. And so this is what I call repair and for regeneration, um, this is what I use for the novo formation of missing things. So this, you know, this, yes, um, this has been, yeah, I mean, there have been papers that look at this question systematically, and the consensus seems to be that it takes about 5,000 cells, um, you know, for this process to work. And just, you know, for reference, um, a medium-sized planarian will consist of about a million cells. So this is indeed, um, you know, a very tiny fraction of the original animal. Um, however, to my mind, uh, you know, the real number of cells that is required is actually probably even lower than that because I guess what this lower limit reflects is simply the minimal size of piece that can still seal the wound. And evidently, this is a prerequisite for regeneration to happen. But behind that, of course, is a question that I would also like to get to um, during, at the end of my talk today. And this is what are actually the, you know, the minimal cues in the system that are required for kickstarting regeneration again. Well, so there's some sort of conservation of energy going on here, right? Because um, while the animal regenerates, it cannot eat, or let's say it cannot eat until it has regenerated all the organs it requires for feeding. And therefore, necessarily, um, if you cut a small piece from the animal, you also get a small planarian. But on the other hand, um, also body size, even without cutting, is extremely variable in these animals. So if you feed them, they grow. And if you take the food away, they shrink. And um, 
Yes, I think, again, this is one of the, you know, a, a prerequisite, actually, for regeneration at such a scale to work, is that the system itself can scale massively in size. All right, so essentially, regeneration works if you um, works in the mediolateral um, direction as well as in the anterior-posterior direction. Second, regeneration works um, if you use, you know, your creativity and you cut, for example, triangles or circles or whatever. They will almost always regenerate back into complete and perfectly proportioned planarians. And on top of that, um, of course, the, well, not of course, actually, but the system also works you know, with cuts that are at different angles and so on and so forth. So long story short, it is incredibly robust. And we can get back to essentially the shape of the planarian body plan irrespective of the starting point. Yep. Very important question. So essentially, is it, you know, yes, it can make head and tail again, but it, does it do so randomly, or is there a memory of polarity in the tissue? And the latter is clearly the case. So um, there are, you know, you can think of it as initial conditions in the tissue, and one of them is indeed a P polarity that dictates that the head always forms at the anterior end and the um, tail always at the posterior end. So this is what I want to get to into tomorrow in much more detail. All right, so in planarians, we get the body shape back irrespective of the starting point, but this actually also generally holds true for regeneration, right? And so again, if we try to conceptualize um, planarian regeneration, especially um, in this uh, arbitrary shape space, then unlike in development, where we have a defined starting point from which morphogenesis ensues, in a system like planarians, there's clearly, whoops, uh, there is clearly, um, you know, not a trajectory, uh, well, no, there's not a defined starting point, but instead random starting points, right, because you can start anywhere out here and you always get back to the body plan. And on top of that, um, there's a landscape rather than a defined trajectory. So somehow, from no matter where you start out here, be it a lateral piece, be it a triangle, be it a circle, the system always tends back to this line in the center, which is, in a way, you can think of it as the equilibrium shape of the system. And moreover, um, the size of this shape can scale, or the shape um, can scale, over a wide area of size ranges. And so, this then, in terms of you know, thinking about the hierarchy of development before, and the hierarchical process of development before, it basically um, adds another level of complexity to um, thinking about the organization of biological material. Because, of course, also all the specification and the making of the right cells, and making the right cells in the right place, also has to happen in the background here. However, this time, you don't have the luxury of a defined starting point um, from which you can evolve the system in a predictable manner. And so, essentially, what I want to do for the, um, per, for the rest of this talk is to um, stay on this question here. How can, in this system, a random piece of tissue reshape itself back into the complete animal? And, um, yep. I just, just to be sure, 100%, <clears throat> I saw many, many um, nobody knows because in this case the you know the wound surface is too large so the piece cannot heal um, and uh, in this sense these pieces just die but what we have tried to do multiple times already is to make sandwiches um, so to basically you know slice an animal in half and then put two dorsal half together so two ventral halves but um, till this day, we haven't really gotten this to work. But this is the challenge I basically set to every rotation student that comes through the lab to you know, try to make the sandwich work. Um, but so, yes, in a way, uh, at the moment, 
we should limit ourselves to saying that, you know, the AP axis can be regenerated no matter from the starting point. But whether DV is also self-organizing, we don't know, but I bet it is. Um, and yeah, we can discuss about this in more detail. So what I want to do today is to first, um, you know, basically give you a tour around the system. So to um, show, to, well, basically explain the principles of planarian biology and physiology that are, of course, the precondition for this to work. Um, secondly, I want to talk about the patterning processes, um, so essentially about the signals that specify the planarian body plan. Um, then, how these signals um, regenerate in such a little piece. Um, then I will, if we have time for that, um, I will go into a few um, specific challenges with respect to patterning that come up in the planarian system. And then finally, in the end, I would like to philosophize a little bit about what it all means, and uh, especially with respect to self-organization. Sorry, there was a question up there. Yes, so that's again the same answer. So this is about 5,000 cells, and this is what's somehow required to initiate regeneration. All right. So first, planarian anatomy. Now, um, in a way, planarians are you know, very ordinary animals in the sense that they contain many of the organs that um, you are familiar with from chickens, pigs, or drosophila, or whatever else you work with. So they have a brain, which is actually relatively complex and contains all the neuro, major neurotypes and neurotransmitters that are also found in vertebrate brains. Um, they have a so-called gastrovasculature system. So this is basically um, the intestine of the animal, which is um, an intricately branching uh, epithelial tube. And this is called gastrovasculature because it both digests the food, but also distributes the food throughout the planarian body plan. Because the one thing planarians don't have is a heart and a circulatory system. And that presumably is also pretty useful because this means they can't bleed to death. On top of that, they have um, you know, a reproductive system. So in, in the sexual strains, so the, um, they, have, uh, they are basically hermaphrodites. The details of this don't matter. And um, they have this uh, muscular feeding organ here, the pharynx, which is basically a muscular tube um, that connects to the intestine at this point here. And this is, in a way, the only body opening of the animal. So they use this for ingesting food, but also for, again, excreting the waste products of, um, of, in, of digestion. And on top of that, planarians are really full of um, stem cells. So this here is just a stem cell staining in red. And these stem cells are highly unusual. So, and they are called neoblasts in planarians. And they are unusual um, as far as stem cells are concerned because, first of all, they are very abundant. So, um, as you can already see from this yellow staining here, about 10% of all cells in the animal are stem cells. And so, the ones of you who are a bit more familiar with vertebrate biology, for example, you will notice that this number is highly unusual because the true stem cells in vertebrates, for example, in the vertebrate blood forming system, are very, very rare. So this would be much more in one cell in 10,000 or even less than that. And on top of that, these stem cells, they basically inhabit um, the, the inside of the animal, so this soft, spongy tissue that surrounds all organs. Um, and this is basically full of these stem cells. Now, these stem cells are highly unusual because, as was shown by Peter Redine's lab in 2011, you can take a single one of these stem cells and transplant it into an animal that is devoid of stem cells, so basically where all stem cells have been killed by irradiation. And what will happen then is that the descendants of this one cell will essentially recolonize the irradiated host and will completely take over the host tissues and again, you know, remake the complete animal. So what this means uh, is, of course, that these stem cells are pluripotent, meaning that they are capable of making each and every cell type in the animal. 
And so in the context or with this um, juxtaposition between development and regeneration, um, this essentially means that every single cell in these animals, well, every single stem cell in these animals is in a way a zygote that is capable of remaking the entire animal. And because the stem cells are everywhere in the animal, um, also all pieces of the animal can regenerate. And um, just to make this point, so here, as you can see, this black hole here where there are no stem cells, this is actually the pharynx that is devoid of stem cells. And you will not be surprised that the pharynx cannot regenerate. And also the tip of the head here, there are no stem cells and also this piece of tissue cannot regenerate. So. Uh, we know from, so one problem is that there's very little life imaging in the system. So we know very little about the actual cell dynamics. But for example, if you irradiate an animal, kill all stem cells, and then you transplant healthy tissue into the animal, then you can see that stem cells indeed move out of this um, transplanted tissue to colonize the host tissues. But how much they move at steady state is unknown at the moment. Yep. We'll get to this in the next slide, but they are highly dynamic. So as an Yeah, except that in this case, the, you know, the de definition of this organ would be that it, that it can be everything, right? So in a way, the, the stem cells are the precondition for making organs. So in, in the way, the stem cells are sort of the naive state that can be utilized to make whatever is missing. From a systems perspective, yes. Uh, you know, from a cell biological perspective, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really go there because you, uh, the, but this is again, to some extent, it's really semantics between the different fields and how different fields think about the same thing. All right, um, so essentially pluripotent stem cells everywhere in the animal. Now, up exactly this question, um, how, to, well, no, oh, sorry, I forgot. Um, but, and we actually know now from uh, single cell sequencing that this is, that really these cells are the origin of all the different cell types in the animal. So basically, um, you know, this hierarchy, this hierarchical diagram of cell fates that I showed you early in the introduction, this essentially also exists in planarians, except that at the top, there is not the fertilized egg but in the, um, at the top, there would be these neoblasts, these pluripotent stem cells, from which um, you know, all the different cell lineages or all the different differentiation lineages in the animal branch out. So therefore, the neoblasts are really the nexus of the planarian cell lineage tree. And on top of that, the neoblasts are the only cells that can actually divide in the system. So this, again, is highly unusual because even the skin cells or the gut cells in planarians cannot divide, right? So, um, and whenever you need to make a new cell in these animals, um, you actually have to, um, uh, somewhere in the system, a stem cell has to divide. And this again, you know, already raises a whole bunch of interesting questions because I've shown you before, the stem cells are outside of the different organs, right? So to replace a cell inside an organ, the stem cell progeny, therefore, also has to migrate to the organ and has to integrate. And so that the entire system also, in this sense, must be very dynamic, that progenitors must migrate over long distances. Now, how dynamic is the system? Well, these stem cells, in a way, continuously divide. So even in a starving animal, um, there will be continuous stem cell divisions. 
However, stem cell divisions can be stimulated by feeding the animal. Um, so that basically generates a pulse of stem cell division. So each feeding event generates essentially a pulse of new cells that are injected into the system. And at the same time, also wounding can have exactly the same effect. Also, if you wound the animal, um, even by just sticking a needle into the worm, this will activate stem cell divisions and also lead to the injection of a new pulse of, system, uh, of cells into the system. So essentially what we have is a more or less continuous genesis of all organismal cell types. And at the same time, there's also a continuous loss of differentiated cells. And here I just show you as one example um, the turnover of epidermal cells. So these are the skin cells on the surface of the animal. And if we label them at time point zero covalently with a dye, the entire surface is essentially green. But what you then see over the um, next couple of days is that actually the green label gets lost because these um, pre-existing cells are being replaced by new cells that come up from below, from the inside of the animal. And so from this we know that the epidermis has essentially a half-life of about like four to five days. And just as an interesting side note, what we also know now from live imaging this turnover is that these cells are not actually shed to the outside, but they actually dive back into the animal. So they invaginate back inside the animal, and very likely the cells actually crawl back down to the gut where they get ingested and eaten. And so the system essentially, rather than wasting the cells, it takes the cells back in and catabolizes them so to recycle their energetic content. But this is a different story. So essentially, while at, um, so at steady state, we also have not only have the continuous biogenesis of new cells, but we also have the continuous loss or the continuous catabolism of pre-existing cells. So what this means essentially is that we are dealing with a highly dynamic system or a highly dynamic steady state, so to speak, in which the neoblasts continuously divide their progeny continuously divides into the different cell types in the animal. And because um, there are so many cell types, this entire process has to be regulated um, by signals that ultimately have to come from differentiated cells. And so already here, you can see some sort of a chicken and the egg loop going on, where essentially the um, neoplast progeny differentiates according to specific signals into the very same cells that are actually producing the signals. On top of that, um, the differentiated cells get replaced by the arrival of new cells. Um, when they die, they are actually um, not lost from the system, but they are catabolized. And this is what allows the system to keep going even when there's no external food around. And so because, um, and that's presumably why the animals actually shrink when you don't feed them because they are literally catabolizing themselves, but they are using this recovered energy in order to maintain the system in a dynamic steady state. Well, not steady state, but in a dynamic state. And now while all of this is going on, and just um, by the way, the timescales for the cell replacement are about maximally three months. So we know from these transplantation studies that um, after about three months, every single cell in the animal will have been replaced by a new cell. And um, so just to say that this cycle is highly dynamic. Yep. And it is sped up because um, of this um, you know, stimulation of stem cell divisions by wounding. And so this injects then, again, you know, literally a bolus of new cells into the system that then um, differentiate faster. But um, in this sense, what is, you know, what is true, what differentiates regeneration from steady state turnover is that steady state turnover essentially occurs within a pre-existing complete set of signals, whereas regeneration then first has to re-establish the signals um, concomitantly with the differentiation of cells. So in a sense, um, 
the two processes are related because both restore the same set of signals, but regeneration in addition has the additional complexity and additional regulatory mechanisms that also allow it to happen faster than and would do at steady state. What is the lifetime? Uh, important question. Yeah, I mean, so it depends because the species or strains that reproduce asexually. So um, the asexual reproduction in this case means that the animals literally rip themselves apart and both halves regenerate. And so in asexually reproducing strains till this day, um, you know, no one has demonstrated any appreciable aging. So it could very well be that these animals are simply not limited by aging and continuously manage to replace themselves. But then on the other hand, um, of the many planarian species out there, there are many species that only live for one season and then die. So also age and lifetime in planarians is incredibly um, wide ranging. DNA um, paradox, uh, so yes. Well, so. What um, the animals are extremely resistant to uh, ionizing irradiation, so it takes about a hundred times more um, irradiation in order to kill a planarian as compared to killing a mouse. Um, and this is because the cells are incredibly good at double stranded DNA repair. But interestingly, um, they probably use error prone DNA repair. So this means that actually the genome of, of these animals, or well, also interestingly, the genome of the stem cells is probably evolving really, really rapidly. And so this then introduces, you know, an entirely different layer of complexity to this. And this is to actually maintain also organismal ident um, um, identity in face of this very rapid genome evolution. So that's also a question we are very interested in. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this is again, uh, you know, this slide here. So essentially, the red circle here, um, these are the, the neoblasts that are division competent. And then um, from this onwards, the, cell, uh, the, the progeny of these cells can enter these different lineages. So this is basically what is depicted here. So, um, and this will mean that, um, you know, such a progeny cell will transition through different um, stages. Um, until ultimately it arrives um, as a, well, or it differentiates into a mature cell type out here. But in between here, these are all um, differentiation stages, so very much like in an embryo, except that here it is happening constitutively. All right, so we have a system in which everything, or well, all the constituent cells are in essence constitutively turning over, but nevertheless, um, the worm will look the same, more or less, day in, day out. So if you just observe the system from the outside, you will not observe any change. And this already raises the first question, and that is how to actually maintain the pattern, so how to maintain the shape of the planarian body plan despite this continuous turnover of cells at the cellular level. And of course, the second question is again this how to regenerate the shape or of the system once you disturb it, for example, by removing specific tissues and specific organs. How do you get back to having all of this? And um, with this, we now move on to patterning. So what are actually ultimately the signals that specify the planarian body plan? Yep. Very tip of the head. They have, uh, they have stem cells sort of between the eyes, but not anterior to the eyes. But again, you know, this is also a very dynamic system. And you can actually see this, that the, the stem cell proliferate and the progeny will continuously move forward. Um, so essentially, this, this, this stem cell free region is continuously also being continuously repopulated by cells that arrive from posterior, more posterior regions. All right, patterning. So now in, um, this is actually to my mind, you know, one of the really fascinating aspects of biology is, 
that despite this diversity of animal body plants that I started with, it's actually only about yeah, maybe, I don't know, four or five signaling pathways that are recycled all over and um, basically are responsible for generating this huge diversity of body plants. So, and this was actually the question that brought me into planarian research, was to simply ask, what are the signals that in planarians specify the body plan? Also, more specifically in this case, what specifies the head-tail axis, because this is simply the easiest to score, since the piece with eyes is clearly a head and the piece without eyes is clearly the tail. So, and what I did, um, or what we started with during my postdoctoral research, is to simply ask which ones of the evolutionarily highly conserved signaling pathways influence this pattern in planarians. And one of the pathways we looked at was the wind signaling pathway. And here the details really don't matter so much for this talk, but just to say that this is a more or less standard signaling pathway in which we have extracellular ligands, so these wind proteins, they are small proteins that can or probably cannot diffuse between cells because they're actually lipid modified. So they bind to transmembrane receptors um, and then the engagement of the ligand initiates this complex intracellular signal transduction cascade which ultimately um, terminates in beta-catenin. So this is not just a junction molecule, but it is also a transcription factor that can um, cause changes in gene expression. And the levels of the transcription factor are controlled such that only when ligand is present on the outside, then the protein is stabilized, so it can accumulate and can uh, affect transcription. Whereas if there's no ligand present, then the protein is constitutively degraded, so it cannot signal. So to ask whether this, um, this pathway influences the planarian body plan pattern, what we did was to um, just knock down beta-catenin or to remove beta-catenin from the system, right? So this basically mimics the off state of the pathway in the absence of ligand. And what happened under these conditions is this. So in this case, the animals actually start to, um, um, start to sprout ectopic heads all along their perimeter. So essentially here, I'm showing you an in situ hybridization for a gene that is normally just expressed at the tip of the head. And just after about two weeks of inhibiting this wind signaling pathway, um, the animal starts to form heads all along the perimeter, and it also converts its existing tail into a new head. So therefore, clearly, um, this pathway, or the inhibition of the pathway, is in a way sufficient for inducing head formation. Yep. So why is it make bigger head on the plan? Well, there are all sorts of uh, interesting, you know, length scales, length scale issues going on here. So actually, there's also a temporal sequence. So if you watch the sequence in which these heads form, then it's stereotypically first the tail that converts into a head, and then um, it is these two headlets that form and then the rest sort of fills in. Um, so I think what, what is clearly going on is that there is some sort of you know, lateral inhibition between neighboring heads. So basically, within an existing head, you cannot form a second head. Um, but then that secondly, uh, the, you know, initially the tail tip here presumably has more space available that can turn into head tissue, therefore it's bigger. And then the second ones that form here, they are then already so closely spaced that they can't really develop much. But that's a question we are really interested in, actually. Hmm? Yes, very good observation. Um, this is also a question we are very interested in, what is going on there. And we actually what we think is that this is, um, you know, sort of a, a consequence of uncoupling um, the head regener the regenerative processes um, from the wound response. Because normally, of course, head formation or de novo head formation also always involves a cut or a wound that triggers a lot of things and basically acts like a timer in the system. Whereas here, we basically bypass all of this layer of regulation by forcing stem cells directly to think that all of this has happened already. And um, 
actually when you stain for the midline in these animals, you will actually see that each one of these heads does contain a midline. And so these animals actually look like a, you know, a spoked wheel where each one of these heads nucleates a new midline that sort of goes and connects to the main midline of the animals. So even so they look cyclopic, they do actually have a midline. Mm -hmm. Again, good question. <laughs> I think it again relates to this, um, you know, to, a, to some sort of a, a time constant in the system. Because again, what we are doing with these um, is we are probably directly affecting the stem cells and we are programming stem cells, um, you know, to initiate this uh, head tip formation. And um, this is going into a lot of details now. Actually, I, this is actually, I think, probably something we best discuss over, to, over a coffee or over a beer. But very interesting question. <laughs> and, yep, sorry. Mm. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, no, these things still move. And uh, essentially, each head um, can control a territory of animals so they can all move independently because they also they all con con contain a brain that is hooked up to the neighboring tissues. Yep. Well, let's say um, I would agree by saying that the, for sure there's no well, even that we can't say. So on the one hand side, there's for sure no global inhibition, right? So, but on the other hand, there is still local inhibition. So that's why we think, you know, that the, the new headlets don't form here because the existing head somehow prevents the formation of new heads. So in this sense, there is feedback, but it is not global. But on the other hand, um, as I will show you later, um, to some extent, we are also uncoupling the stem cells from the feedback because we directly affect the stem cells per se. But again, also um, this then, because the, the, you know, the reprogrammed stem cells give rise to new cells that again generate feedback that feeds back. That's why we end up with these different headlets here. So yes, there is feedback, but it happens on multiple layers, and most of these layers we don't understand yet. That's the short answer. <laughs> OK, now, so this is the consequences of having too little signaling in the system, uh, too little wind signaling in the system. Oh, I'm really sorry, I forgot to start that. <laughs> now, um, if, on the other hand, uh, what, of course, this is now in, uh, the next question, so what happens if there's too much of this signal in the system? And what happens then is what we call the gummy bear phenotype in the lab. So now, these, you know, also obviously things go catastrophically wrong. And in this sense, catastrophic, going catastrophically wrong means that now the head disappears. So the animals don't have a brain anymore. They don't have any eyes anymore, no anterior tissue. And instead what happens is that the entire animal now converts essentially into tail fate. So if you were to look for gene expression in here, you would see that the entire animal, so all the cells express tail genes ultimately. So, and moreover, in this case, there's actually a complete loss of pattern. So these animals won't have a midline anymore. Um, and there's just basically a diffuse amorphous mass of tail tissue, so to speak. But as you can see, they are still alive. So this is actually a movie. And um, these animals will still hang around for about two, three, four months until they have shrunk to such a size that they are just too small to sustain life. Uh, no. So first of all, that the tail, the heads here always form around the perimeter. That is also something that is, you know, that we don't really understand. We have some theories about it, but there's clearly something about the equatorial plane or the the body edge of the animal that um, makes it easier for um, you know, de novo patterns to initiate. 
Um, and also in the case of the tails actually here, and this is more or less what's happening, except that what you, you, know, what you see here as the 3D aspect is actually the animal curving and, and folding. So it is still more or less flat, but it is just folding in all directions. But also it's um, actually these, you know, the, the tail-like thingies that are forming here are not actually true tails in the sense that they have this pattern from the tail tip inwards, but they are just amorphous masses of, of tail tissue. So the two processes are different in the sense that here we don't form new tail organizing centers. It is just a wholesale conversion into tail fates. This will become a little bit clearer later on in the talk, I hope. All right. Oh, sorry. Another question. Um, in this case, no, but this is simply for technical reasons because what we use here is um, RNA interference. Right? And because, so basically by putting double-stranded RNA into the system that then prevents expression of the genes. But there's very likely amplification happening. So these double-stranded RNAs are being remade and so basically stay in the system. So that's why we can't just simply turn this off. But we can um, also achieve the same phenotypes with pharmacology. And in this case, we can wash out the drugs. And so this is exactly what we are doing right now to ask whether this can revert back to the shape or not. All right, but as for the purposes of this slide, what this simply means is that um, this wind signaling um, pathway clearly maintains the planarian head tail axis, right? I think this is what these phenotypes show very, very graphically. And this not only happens during steady state, um, but it also happens during regeneration. And so in this case, what we do is we simply consider the middle piece here, and we ask how this now regenerates under conditions where wind is inhibited. And this is what we get here. Um, one second. This should be a movie. Ah, but it is not. Um, so in this case, the animals will now always make a head at both ends. Um, and again, these heads are perfectly functional, containing a brain and everything. And in the movie, you would actually see that both are trying to move in opposite directions. And so these animals, these double-headed animals, are constitutively engaged into some sort of tug of war. Um, now, secondly, again, if we have too much of the signal in the system, then now both ends of the piece will actually form tails. Again, the animals are alive, but in this case, the tails are actually pushing inwards rather than trying to pull away from each other. And this is what I want to get into tomorrow more. Yep. Also, if you will, you know, if you will cut this animal again, no matter where you will cut it, it will always make a hit. So even if you, even if you just make like a, a little wound that normally would just heal, even under these conditions, it will make a hit. And the same here. So um, you know, it will also always make tail. But now again, this is the same question: whether this is now, um, you know, because we have sort of end, like altered the fundamental parameters of the system or simply because the effects of the treatment are still persisting, this is what um, for which we need the pharmacology then to answer these questions. Yep. Very good question. Um, what you can see here, you know, these little wings that are forming here, these are actually, this is the beginning of this process that, you know, new heads are forming on the side. And again, we are dealing simply with different time scales. So because, um, you know, the new heads, they will form very quickly and it takes longer for the lateral heads to appear, but they will appear eventually. Uh, interestingly, they don't do that actually. Um, yeah, good question. No, we have never observed that. So that's, you know, that's again um, this question here that, yes, there seems to be something special about the, um, the, the margins, the dorsoventral body margins, and that, um, and so predominantly we see the heads there, 
but sometimes, and especially if you wait for long periods of time, you can see heads also popping out dorsally or ventrally, but most of the time they, they are you know, much more amorphous and much less well organized. So meaning that it is not absolutely necessary to have this margin localization, but that it is much more likely to form a head at the margin, and probably also the margin provides additional patterning inputs that are actually required for making a well-shaped head, which you don't have dorsally and ventrally. Yep. So they will essentially, um, you know, these guys can no longer eat because they don't have, they lose the feeding tube. Um, but they will degrow at the normal rate. And so um, it takes about eight months for a planarian to degrow from, for this species to degrow from its largest size to its smallest size um, when they are simply unable to maintain life, so to speak. And so also these things, if you start with a very large animal, you can easily keep them for a couple of months until they become so small that they disintegrate. And this um, also applies to the, um, you know, to the brainless, double-tailed animals. So clearly these animals do not need a brain for long-term survival. And this asks the question of what a brain is actually good for, of course. All right. So then, um, you know, just summarizing now uh, these last two slides is that wind signaling is clearly necessary for maintaining the planarian head-tail axis. And moreover, when you think about you know, these last two slides, then um, this wind signaling pathway actually acts like some sort of molecular switch where low levels of signaling activity are necessary and sufficient for head formation, whereas high levels of signaling activity are necessary and sufficient for tail formation. And now given that, you know, head formation and tail formation is even so it sounds like a binary decision here, when you think about um, the biology behind that, it is actually all but binary because head means you have to make a brain, you have to make eyes, you have to hook it up and you have to hook them up to the rest of the tissue, whereas tail means you have to make a whole bunch of different things all arranged in, again, in specific patterns. And so this then raises, of course, the question of how can a single signaling pathway, in this case, maintain or instruct anatomical complexity. And this is essentially what has kept us busy for the last um, couple of years and what will keep us busy for the next couple of years. Uh, what we know so far is that in the intact animal, wind signaling actually forms a gradient along the planarian AP axis. So where in the tail, we have the highest levels of pathway activity, and in the head, we have the lowest levels of pathway activity. And this, um, essentially, we measure at the level of beta-catenin, so the signaling output of the pathway. So we don't really know yet, or we cannot measure the actual distribution of the signals, but we will get back into this later. Now, we know that this gradient is functionally very important, because it controls the expression of many genes. So again, here using our, simple, uh, our favorite, what we call the salami slicing paradigm in the lab, where we just cut animals into a series of slices. And then in this case, when we do deep sequencing of each slice, so we basically get an overview of the expression levels of all the genes in the genome, now systematically along the anterior-posterior axis. What we find is that many genes in planarians are actually systematically expressed along the AP axis, including many genes that, are, um, that basically have these tail to head expression gradients. We have many genes that show head to tail expression gradients. And there's also interestingly a class, a large class of genes that shows these sort of, you know, like bell-shaped profiles in the center of the animal. Now we know from manipulating the wind signaling gradient that actually the wind signaling gradient directly controls the expression of these tail genes and it indirectly affects also the expression of the head genes and of these center genes. And now finally, 
why um, it does that is because um, actually one of the cell types that respond to wind signaling are actually the stem cells, are the neoblasts that we can show here. And moreover, in neoblasts, with the genes that are regulated by wind signaling, include um, many transcription factors um, that you will have heard of probably already during the course of this course. So for example, different Hox genes that throughout animal, uh, animal phylogeny are involved or implicated in specifying regionalized cell fates. So essentially, you know, putting all of this together now, the concept that is emerging is that this wind signaling gradient is essentially converted into a transcription factor expression gradient within these pluripotent stem cells. And this is conceptually important because it means that even so, um, the stem cells are pluripotent all along the AP axis, so they can make all different tissues all along the AP axis, because now if a stem cell is located in a tail, it will express a different set of transcription factors than a stem cell that is located in the head, and therefore at least you can conceptualize how the same pluripotent stem cells all along the AP axis can give rise to different cell fates along the AP axis. Yep. So are the inner organs? Uh, there's very little evidence to that, but we do know, for example, from certain cilia phenotypes that there is chirality in the animals. There is no nodal in planarians, so this is missing. Um, but we, so in the case of the cilia, it is actually, you know, very likely the intrinsic um, um, chirality of the, of the centrio that gives rise to that. And we don't think that there is, um, you know, a systematic left-right um, signal in planarians, actually. All right. And this is now, um, you know, the, basically the paradigm for the head to tail axis, but very similar things as again shown in this paper by Peter Redeen are also happening about along the dorsal ventral axis. So basically dorsal is back, ventral is belly. And in planarians, as in many animals, the signal that specifies the dorsal ventral axis is actually BMP. So this is DPP in Prosophila which the flywing aficionados will know as basically specifying the pattern in the Drosophila wing disc. And this is high dorsally, low ventrally, so it generates basically some sort of gradient profile along the dorsal ventral axis. And again, this con is converted into, diff in the, into the expression of different markers into the stem cells. So basically, stem cells that are located ventrally will express a gene um, that is not expressed in stem cells that are located dorsally. And so, again, it is essentially the same concept of positional dependence. So that, yes, the stem cells can make everything, but depending on the environment in which they find themselves, the total number of lineage choices will be restricted to specific trajectories. And so, altogether, therefore, you can think of the organization of this dynamic steady state in planarians, actually, as something very, very similar to an embryo, where, in fact, patterning, as we could demonstrate, is, in fact, also dependent on the signaling gradients. And because, again, signaling gradients are converted into the specific cell fates, you can actually think of um, a whole planarian as sort of on the conceptual level as something like a French flag, where, for example, different levels of wind signaling might give rise to, you know, different cell types along the AP axis. One disclaimer, so first of all, we don't think that wind signaling actually acts like a French flag um, system. We can talk about this more later. Second, um, we know that there must be a second patterning system, basically a second gradient, that um, comes uh, like extends from the head towards the posterior. To our shame, we still don't know what this actually is, and this is one of the questions we are deeply interested in. But on top of that, and especially for the purposes of this lecture, 
Um, I just want to stress that what we actually want to understand is not some sort of one-dimensional stripe of cells, but we want to understand how this entire complexity of the planarian body plan can actually be generated. And this raises a whole bunch of really interesting questions, so especially in, in conjunction with yesterday's lecture about the information content of the gradients. So this is a question I am thinking about a lot and that we also discuss a lot in the lab, is you know, how ultimately um, the system generates the amount of information to give rise to this fine-grained anatomy. So it is clear that a single gradient or wind gradient cannot specify the branching patterns in the gut or cannot specify the fine distribution of muscle fibers or something like this. Yet at the same time, it is a very important part of the system, as we could show previously. And again, the way we think about it and we rationalize um, this is to think that these gradients are probably um, very, very far upstream in a hierarchy, again, of different um, patterning processes that are elicited downstream of the gradients. So again, very much like this hierarchical patterns within patterns model within embryonic development, except that here it must be happening constitutively at steady state. Yep. We, we will get into this in the, in the next part. All right, and this is actually exactly the next question <laughs> because um, you know this is now um, the question of how do you restore this pattern in a random uh, regeneration fragment and this is so you know clear now from everything we've been saying if these long-range gradients are such a key element of patterning the steady state then from this it follows that also the regeneration of a random piece of tissue back into the complete animal must entail the regeneration of these gradient patterns. And so this is a question of how this happens because when you think about these gradients in terms of you know, traditional morphogen gradients, then there's a little elephant in the room. And this is that the traditional morphogen gradients, they are envisaged to work via um, you know, a localized cell population releasing the signal, right? So this is basically the source. The signal then spreads out into the tissue via diffusion while at the same time it is being degraded. And so this then um, establishes this graded concentration gradient profile that um, uh, is basically studied in many different systems. However, the problem of thinking about morphogen gradients in a regenerative system, of course, is that it might, it might just so happen that your amputation event removes the source, right? So in this case, it would mean chopping off the tail tip in a planarian, so that would remove the highest point of wind signaling levels. And so, of course, in a traditional morphogen model, a morphogen gradient model, what would happen under these conditions is that actually the, um, the residual morphogen in the tissue just dissipates and you are very rapidly left with no information at all. And therefore, hence again the question, what shapes actually this wind signaling gradient as a prototypical example in planarians in general and especially in planarian tissue pieces during regeneration? And <clears throat> uh, again, from just from looking at this traditional view of the wind signaling pathway with the extracellular wind ligand that essentially ultimately stabilizes beta-catenin to do its uh, transcriptional jobs, um, you would think that clearly one way or one origin of the gradient should one, one origin of the beta-catenin gradient that we've been talking about all the time now should involve the graded distribution of wind ligands in the system. And to some extent this is true because there are many different wind ligands in planarian, so altogether there are about 10 and about five of them, or six of them actually, are expressed in the tail. And almost invariably, they are already expressed um, in the form of gradients. So this is now very different, for example, from the Drosophila system, where the gradients would be set up by the diffusion of the actual protein that is expressed in a spot. Here, the signal is already expressed in gradients. 
And I have to say, until um, this day, we cannot actually visualize the wind proteins, so we don't know what the shape of the wind protein gradients are in the system. So, in this sense, you know, this is consistent at least that in an intact animal, um, there's a, a gradient of wind signal expression that then um, parallels the gradient of beta catenin or of signaling activity in the system. But this then simply raises the question, ah, yeah. and moreover, we know that these wind gradients are functionally important because no, like whenever we take away one of these different wind ligands by RNAi again, we also affect uh, or we downregulate this beta catenin gradient here shown in black to different extents. So we think that the overall shape of the beta catenin signaling gradient in the animal is actually some sort of integral of the different shapes of the wind expression gradients. So this then raises the question of fine, now we have the wind gradients, the wind expression gradients that are upstream of beta catenin of the beta catenin gradient. But now what is it that actually shapes these wind expression gradients? And to this extent, a real surprise in the lab was that um, whenever essentially we disturb the wind signaling pathway, so for example, whenever we take away one of these wind ligands that are expressed in the tail, uh, and then we observe what happens to the expression of, again, of all the genes in the animal. What we find is that invariably, when we take away wind ligands, that also a bunch of other wind ligands, but also wind receptors and wind transduction components are similarly being downregulated. Right? So in a way, you touch one wind, you take away one wind, and most of the other winds and also receptors and everything else goes away. But on the other hand, when we now force, when we upregulate wind signaling in the animal, so by forcing the stabilization of beta catenin, what we then find is that the same genes are also all being upregulated. So, and what this actually means in the end is that beta catenin, so basically the output of the pathway, uh, is what's um, upstream of the input to the pathway, namely these wind ligands. So in other words, and we do have a bit more data on that um, to show that this is really happening, but the conclusion from this is that actually this wind signaling gradient in many ways shapes itself because of this link between, so to speak, morphogen activated morphogen production. And so what we are dealing with is a chicken and the egg situation here where the wind ligand shape the beta catenin gradient, but the beta catenin gradient in turn shapes the wind ligands. And whereas this may sound you know, really disturbing to a molecular biologist, um, this general scheme of in a way self-organizing gradients or patterns is of course um, something that is seen all over in biology. Right? So I'm not sure how much you talked about Turing patterns and things like this during this week already. The, the mass of that, exactly. So I, I can just do the phenomenology of it now, that um, all sorts of um, phenomena in biology, you know, have been explained on basis of Turing patterns. You've done the math of it, so you will know this, that essentially very often um, very simple feedback systems in which you can have, um, you know, an, an, uh, one component of the system that has a positive feedback on itself, um, a second component of the system that is basically also produced dependent on the first component, but acts by inhibiting the first component. So such simple feedback systems under the appropriate chemical physical characteristics um, can actually give rise to self-organizing in spontaneous patterns that form. Now, um, also, and I would you know, state that this is probably generally true, that even so, these Turing patterns have become very popular to explain all sorts of things in biology. Um, I would say that in very few systems, maybe with the exception of one or two, have actually the actual mechanisms been elucidated so that it's clear that this is really what's going on. Um, however, nevertheless, um, this um, framework of self-organizing patterns is, of course, very um, conceptually appealing, especially in regeneration, because it can um, explain exactly this conundrum 
of pattern formation without the need for pre-specification, right? So in a way, it can give you a mechanism that can generate gradients um, independent of explicitly specifying the source. And therefore, also, it can generate a system that can regenerate gradients um, because all cells that are participating in it are essentially um, equal in the sense that they all could be either at the tip of the gradient or at the base of the gradient, and whether they are just depends on their position in the tissue. So just to say that this is conceptually very important in regeneration research. And now, again, our sort of very hand-wavy model of how we envisage the patterning of the planarian AP axis to work um, is that we think that we are dealing with at least two long-range gradients. Um, as I already said, this wind gradient in the tail, a second gradient in the head that we don't know what it is. And importantly, these two, uh, these two patterns, these two spatial patterns, mutually inhibit each other. And that makes them mutually exclusive, right? You can either only be head or you can only be tail. And now, because of this mutual inhibition, um, when we force wind signaling to be high all over, so we basically force this gradient now high to, uh, to be all along the AP axis, that's why the head system disappears. Um, and we end up with these gummy bear phenotypes where heads are basically everywhere. Well, sorry, where the tissue is diffusely tail expressing. If, on the other hand, we kill the tail system, now then the entire animal now becomes competent for initiate, uh, for, to initiate pattern formation via the head system. And so that's how we rationalize the multi-headed animals. Now, the reason or one important reason for why we think we need two independent patterning systems is first of all that, that by removing the tail system, we don't just end up with an animal that is a diffuse mat of head, mass of head, um, but we end up with discrete heads. And secondly, also, we know that head and tail are independent because if we look at the double-tailed animals, they actually do have um, wind gradients coming from either end of the, of, the, of the animal. So that means that you can have a tail gradient independent of having a head. And so, in essence, therefore, we think that what makes, um, what generates these patterns in the planarian, or what maintains the patterns in the planarian AP axis at steady state, and what regenerates them during regeneration, are essentially self-organizing patterns that are linked by mutual antagonism. Yep. Self-activation. Unknown thing. We assume that it is. Okay. Now, if you that process, would regulate that symmetry. Because um, in this case, the, you know, what gives pattern or the, the way the wind signal gives pattern to the system or the way the wind signal patterns the system is via the gradient, right? By basically having this graded distribution of signaling activity in the tissue. Now, this is what we kill by making it high everywhere. So, right, we essentially in, um, uh, remove the gradient information, the gradient part. Whereas for the head system, this is different because here we don't manipulate the head system directly, right? We just take away the inhibitory influence that normally prevents it from activating in the tail. And thereby, we essentially allow the head system now to activate itself all over, but in activating itself means to form gradients again all over. So the symmetry is different because in this case, by manipulating wind, the way we manipulate it, we destroy or we remove the gradient information, whereas the head system still has the graded signal information. Any more on this admittedly somewhat hand wavy state of affairs? How much time do I have left? Three minutes, oh my God. <laughs> then, um, then I will basically skip uh, over all the specific challenges of the system. And 
this is now one of the challenges is that the length scales over which these gradients form in the planarian system are very much larger than the length scales of traditional morphogen systems in development that all happen between about 50 to 500 microns whereas intact planarians are a bit up to two and a half centimeters long and there are even land planarians that are a meter long so and uh, you know that's basically clear to easy to show that traditional diffusion gradients or traditional morphogen gradients cannot work. And so together with Frank, we are now thinking about propagation gradients that essentially incorporate this wind dependent wind expression. And we can show that um, with these models, um, at least conceptually, we can form patterns over much longer long, um, length, length ranges. Um, a second challenge that we have in the system is what we, I will talk a lot more about on the third day, and this is um, that planarians don't have a fixed body size, right? They grow and they shrink, and if you cut a large piece, you get a large worm. If you cut a, sm a small piece, you get a small worm. But nevertheless, the patterning um, within the worm scales beautifully. And so both the wind signaling gradient, for example, in different lengths animals um, scales rather nicely, also, the gene expression patterns in the head and in the tail and in the center, they also scale. So this means we somehow need to have patterning systems that can adapt to variable length scales. This is, again, a problem we've been thinking about a lot with Frank. So we, um, so, and Frank and, and Stefan, they come, came up with a model that can even um, explain you know, scalable um, touring systems, so to speak. But moreover, we are now also very excited about this um, in the context of this propagation gradient model because this offers a whole bunch of new scaling options that we are very excited about. But again, the burden of proof or the challenge now is to actually nail the cell biology that's underlying all of these things. And so finally, on um, to a little bit of philosophizing. And this is again, in the end, I would like to get back to this um, you know, apparent difference between um, human morphogenesis and biological morphogenesis. And this is sort of to ask, what is, what is it actually? Or what does, it, what does this mean to say that um, biology generates shape via the autonomous shaping of active materials? And one concept in this case that I found very, very um, important was actually, oops, uh, where's the acknowledgement here? Um, by uh, these philosophers, uh, by Argentina, I think are from Argentina or Chile. So, and, and the, the book is called The Tree of Life, I believe, in, in English. And essentially, what they are wondering is about or speculating about what are the material properties of biological systems that makes them different from physical systems. And they um, essentially coined the term of autopoietic unit that cells are autopoietic units that can make themselves, right? And so this is sort of a biological truism. Um, to make a new cell, you need an existing cell. However, um, in addition, cells interact with their environment, both in the sense of being able to be changed by their environment, right? So think about different cell fates that a stem cell can adapt depending on the environment. But at the same time, cells also change their environment because they themselves can again express signals or generate forces or generate metabolites that can influence the environment. Now this becomes really important because if you put multiple cells together into a tissue in which all are in a way plastic, meaning they can change their own properties at the same time as changing the environment, then actually you set up the potential for complex um, dynamics within such an interconnected system. And the fact that biological systems do that um, is evident by the fact that out of such interactions be between cells and the mutual reprogramming of environment and own identity, you can up, end up with things like um, adult zebrafish ultimately. Now, actually, a very graphic example of that these things are happening continuously is actually shown to the left here. This is a teratoma. So this is basically a germ cell tumor in a mouse in this case. And when you cut open this tumor, what you actually find inside there is a ball of hair. You find teeth. You find muscles. You find bone. So basically, 
more or less all constituents of the organism are found in there. On the other hand, here to the right, this is a brain organoid. So basically something that was derived by putting an embryonic stem cell in the right environment. And also this one cell will give rise to something that, is, um, that contains a lot of the complexity of an adult brain. And what this essentially illustrates is exactly this. So the mutual feedback between individual cells that change their fate depending on their environment, which is again influenced by their neighbors. However, I think you will all agree that um, this and this is very much unlike this or this or a normal mouse brain. So in other words, even so cells can spontaneously make more or less all the components of a mouse or all the components of a brain, if you do that, um, if you trigger them spontaneously, they will not manage to generate the right shapes and the right proportions and all the things we are interested in. So again, the question, what is missing? So very, very briefly here, I think one concept that is you know, gaining a lot of traction in the field now is this concept of guided self-organization. And this is that, yes, ultimately, we are, or biology deals with these highly interconnected systems in which all components influence each other. But the way that you can generate um, um, predictable outcomes from such systems is by essentially fixing or specifying the boundary conditions um, of the self-organizing reactions. Here, just an example for Turing systems that we don't have to go into. But I think the, the concept here is, again, when you think about development as basically being a hierarchy of patterns within patterns, then in this concept, what this would basically mean is that the, the outcome of the previous patterning reaction is set up such that it defines the boundary conditions of the next patterning reaction. And this, at least, I think, is a powerful concept to think of how you can channel um, uh, like ultimately self-organizing reactions into predictable directions. But now, um, and in the case of planarians, we, yeah, I, I will just get into this on the third day, how we envisage here what the, actually, what the system boundary conditions are and how they influence with the patterning things, but more on that on the third day. And I think finally, you know, a real practical question, and this is also, I think, deeply relevant to this course is, how do we go about it? How do we actually understand such highly interconnected systems, not just in terms of pretty pictures or beautiful theory, but how do we understand them really in the actual sense of understanding? And of course, one approach to this is the cell biological approach. And this is, in a way, what cell biology tries to do, um, is to generate linear cause consequence chains, right? So this would be your typical cell biological mechanism uh, that is basically, in the end, a chain of cause-consequence reactions. Now, this is, um, in a way, a useful approximation of biological phenomena at a given organizational scale. But on the other hand, um, this is not how biology works in most cases, because actually, I think, much more often then a linear chain of cause consequences, especially if you can, can um, look at, uh, at larger scales of organization, you will actually find that you are always dealing with these circular, in a way, self-referential feedback loops. And this, in a way, is a problem because cell biology on its own is very ill-equipped to, um, to uh, deal with these sort of self-referential systems. And I think this is also, to some extent, where where really physics um, or the physical way of looking at systems and, and describing systems can, can very much help because just as this pattern of cell, this example of self-organizing patterns illustrates, so I think what this ultimately does is to reconcile emergence of patterns um, with causality. So in the sense that even so we don't have a linear cause-consequence chain, we still um, can have a mechanism that explains the emergence of the pattern. Um, moreover, physical systems, I think, are very useful and very important for demonstrating sufficiency because from, you know, as a cell biologist, you are always aware 
that yes, you may be studying an endosome at this moment, but at the same time, there's also the endoplasmic reticulum, there are microtubules, there's actin, there are so many other things in the cell that could all influence the system you are looking at. So therefore, as a cell biologist, you are always very, very cautious in actually you know, saying, now I understand the system. Whereas from a physical, um, the physical approach of trying to model the system, trying to define the state variables in the system, can therefore be a very, very helpful um, you know, focus also for new experiments and on specific components. And finally, there's, I think, what physics can do is to provide a formal view of mechanism. Because again, a cell biologist may tell you that this is how this, um, this cascade works. But also a cell biologist will always tell you that um, there are so many things that we are unsure about and uh, that um, you know, this needs to be checked and that needs to be checked. And again, I think by having sort of a quantitative description of what is going on, um, this also actually helps to understand the process a lot more deeper than what cell biology alone can do. But then finally, of course, also physics and theory is not the magic bullet. And theory can also be very beautiful, but it still means that it doesn't actually describe the system. So I think ultimately, to understand such interconnected systems, we will always need both. And I do apologize for running over time. I thank the crew, um, and uh, yes, and especially the physicists here. And yeah, yes, because we are moving to Göttingen, and the scale of operations is somewhat increasing, we also do have lots of opportunities in the lab. Thank you. Mm. Thank <clears throat> you.